I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I truly hope you are safe and, of course, sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual discussions, at least for now, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. I'm truly pleased and honored this morning to host uh, Kevin Rudd, twice Prime Minister of Australia and now President and CEO of the Asia Society. Kevin, welcome uh, welcome to Carnegie Connects. It's terrific great, to see you. Great, great to be with you, Aaron. Uh, you, you know, your reputation as one of the finest uh, China analysts and watchers on the planet precedes you. And uh, I also want to congratulate you on your new book. I'm going to sure you get the title, right, which I guess is out and available beginning tomorrow. Uh, yeah, it's called uh, The Avoidable War. Here you go. I have one with me. I just was promoting it before. Please. <laughs> The Avoidable War, colon, the dangers of a catastrophic conflict between the U.S. and uh, uh, Xi Jinping's China. So to get started, I, I want to try to unpack, um, um, before we turn to the current crisis, um, maybe we can take a, a step back and you can give us a Kevin Rudd primer on the drivers of this much-touted strategic partnership. Uh, barely a month plus ago, it seems like an eternity now, Lenin was probably right that some weeks contain decades. Um, President Xi and Putin met uh, and declared that their, in a 5,000 word statement, that their partnership, quote, had no limits, unquote. So could we begin by having you outline for us the nature of, let's call it a strategic partnership, maybe they have as well, the nature of that strategic partnership, and if you can, if you can, if you would, prioritize the key issues that drive it. Sure. I think it's a good place to begin the, uh, let's call it the joint declaration by Putin and Xi Jinping in Beijing on the 4th of February. Um, this uh, joint strategic um, partnership between uh, Russia and China. Uh, a little bit on the history of it first, it's not the first such document. They've been rolling various iterations of this document out since about 2001. Um, but if you look at the text of the document, it's by far and above the longest, most expansive and most intense in its language and in its provisions. Um, you've just paraphrased it correctly before. That's the document which says that they're embarking upon a strategic uh, partnership where there are no limits in terms of the scope for collaboration in the future. And it names all the areas in security and foreign policy and um, in uh, economic collaboration, as well as um, policies towards the rest of the world. So this is deep and it's profound. And I think the important point in the analysis, Aaron, is this. Uh, it's also driven on the Chinese side uh, in significant part by Xi Jinping's personal chemistry uh, with Vladimir Putin. And that is a live factor in this. Normally, you and I would say, well, there are interests of state and there are the passing interests of individual political leaders. That's true. Uh, raison d'etat, they tend to last for a long time. Um, uh, Lord Acton says there's no such thing as permanent friendships, international politics, only the permanency of state interests. That's all true. Um, but when you've got folks like uh, Vladimir Putin, who's been in office one way or another for 22 years, and Xi Jinping, who'd like to be in office uh, for uh, 22 years or so himself, if not longer, the two things start to merge. My final point would be, what's the underlying Chinese set of interests here? Um, and where does uh, Xi Jinping's personal interest uh, fuse with that? The underlying Chinese strategic interest is pretty simple. It's one, how do I turn what has historically been a problematic border between China and the Russian Federation, and prior to that, the Soviet Union, prior to that, Tsarist Russia, into uh, something which is benign and advantageous to the point that I can focus all of my strategic efforts externally, 
towards the real challenge for 20th century, 21st century power, and that is the United States of America. How can I focus primarily and exclusively on my maritime periphery as opposed to being continually worried about my continental periphery mm. uh, with, uh, with the Russian Federation? That's the underlying strategic uh, rationale here, which has been unfolding since Gorbachev and uh, Deng Xiaoping resolved the border way back in 1989. Um, but Xi Jinping has turbocharged that. The second thing is um, the Chinese like having the Russians provide a strategic distraction to the United States, both in Europe and the Middle East, because it keeps the United States fighting, as it were, on several fronts at once, rather than just focusing on the Indo-Pacific, uh, shall I say, maritime frontier of the Chinese. And then finally, the Chinese have an interest in long-term supply of critical commodities uh, to China itself, uh, oil, gas, wheat, uh, agricultural products, including forestry. And because it's next door, um, it uh, provides easier lines of supply uh, than is the case uh, with the China's own more vulnerable maritime choke points to other points of supply around the world. Thank you, uh, economical and, uh, and wise. Um, if it's strategic though, Kevin, it, it, that suggests it's enduring and you've now tied it to the personal political careers of both men. Uh, if you are uh, President Xi now looking at the strategic partnership he made, and this is Xi's policy, not the relation with Russia, but it, as you described it, the turbocharging. He's now looking at a strategic distraction for the United States and Europe, the biggest probably since uh, in the course of the last 70 years in Europe. Um, is there buyer's remorse now, um, both on a personal level? Uh, does she feel it all betrayed or undermined? Uh, did Putin promise? Did he mislead? And then second, it seems clear that uh, she has now tied his policy to uh, Putin's you know, revisionism, which is now brutal, if not savage, in Ukraine. So. Any buyer, buyer's remorse, is it a bad bet? I think um, when we again uh, look at what drives the Chinese interest here in the Russia relationship and the Putin relationship in particular, uh, if I could give it this sort of numerical summary, it's six parts out of 10 abiding in strategic interests, four parts out of 10 personal um, and leader specific interests. So it's a one of those admixtures which we need to pay close attention to as it unfolds. On the question of buyer's remorse, uh, I have uh, no doubt in my mind that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, would have informed the Chinese when he was in Beijing around about the fourth of February for the opening of the Beijing Olympics that there will be a, there would be a military action in Ukraine. Um, there is uncertainty as to how specific he would have been about the nature of the military action, uh, whether it was going to be the classic Donbass operation, which many people had been predicting, or the comprehensive invasion, which is what subsequently unfolded. But that would have constituted a territorial violation uh, of the sovereignty of the Ukraine, without doubt. I say that because Putin could not have put himself in the position, given his critical interests in China, uh, of misleading Xi Jinping at that critical juncture. So he would have said enough, in my view, to Xi Jinping to have been consistent with what subsequently unfolded, even if it was laced with opacity in the tradition of the opacity of the Kremlin when it seeks to be opaque. Um, on the um, question of how Xi Jinping views what has now unfolded, I think the Chinese system is surprised by two things. One is... Uh, I think they had, um, I was going to use an Australian crudity there, but I won't. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think they had bought the idea, there you go, uh, that uh, the Russian military uh, was um, uh, going to be immediately prevalent in the field. And this literally would be a two to three day blitzkrieg. I think they bought that. 
and they, like the rest of the world, I think, have been stunned and staggered by two factors, uh, Russian military incompetence plus uh, Ukrainian courage um, and determination um, and Zelensky's leadership. So I think that's uh, a surprise uh, for them. The second surprise has been this. As good Marxist Leninists, the Chinese sit back and look at things and they believe that there are these di dialectical forces at work. Um, and their general assumption had been that once um, Putin had declared his military intention, that the rest of Europe would have quietly cowered in the corner and watched quietly what happened. Um, well, the rest of Europe was galvanized instead. Um, and as you know, there's been unprecedented NATO unity. And within Europe, this extraordinary statement by Olaf Scholz to the Bundestag a couple of weeks ago, uh, a centre-left German Chancellor committing Germany to uh, a very considerable defence um, uh, expenditure for the future uh, because the world had changed, as he said, because of what Putin did in Ukraine. That surprised Beijing as well because they've always seen the Europeans as strategically soft. So does that bring about a change in Chinese uh, attitude to what now happens on the ground in Ukraine or what they do with Putin? That's a more complex question. If you've already invested so much in this relationship and the abiding strategic interests in the Russia relationship uh, are, as I described before, um, then you're not going to abandon your man uh, quickly. Um, otherwise, uh, you're going to lose that which you've already gained in terms of these abiding strategic interests which China has been pursuing in its relationship with the Russians. However, if they've reached a judgment, uh, Aaron, that um, Putin was going to fail militarily uh, in Ukraine, um, then, as a consequence of that, my sense is the Chinese at five minutes to midnight may then try to inject real as opposed to nominal uh, diplomacy and trying to mediate a ceasefire in order to recapture some, as it were, international diplomatic standing for themselves, having seen their own international reputation hit pretty hard by their degree of complicity with what's gone on uh, with the Russians so far. It's stunning the degree to which she's assessment of the Europeans, um, Russia's military capability, you didn't mention what she thought of the U.S. reaction. But on those three points, the, you know, the, the the members of the what you could call the first autocrats club, basically came to the same conclusion, hmm. uh, and they were wrong, which says a lot about the dangers of hermetically sealing a leader. Uh, if in fact they're not getting the information that they actually need to make accurate assessments. So just to summarize on this piece, you would describe the Russia-China relationship not as a, it would be nice to have for Xi. You believe it's a must have for Xi. And that if you took it away, play a counterfactual game, if there were no Russian, no Russia, okay? If Russia became North Korea or Iran, a pariah, completely cut off from the international community, uh, an economy broken by the, eco you know, the economic nuclear bomb that the world has dropped on the Russian economy, how would China's policies or position change? Well, I'm glad you used the analogies with um, North Korea and Iran, because despite them both being international uh, pariahs in many respects, um, China has maintained close relations with both of them. <laughs> and, um, and it does not see an incompatibility between doing that with pariah states, including Venezuela, by the way, um, um, on the one hand, while pursuing, quote, normal relations with the rest of the world. The Chinese place a great store in the fact that uh, they believe the Europeans, while having hardened up of the Ukraine, will then suffer from what they would describe as the usual strategic amnesia in Europe, and they'll forget about it in a year or two, right. um, and that things will normalise. And as you know, there is some basis for that scepticism given uh, recent European postures on a whole range of security policy questions, starting from Georgia through Ukraine and elsewhere. Um, but um, I think the Chinese may be in danger of miscalculating the traumatic impact which this, as it were, blood spilt on the continent of Europe has had on European consciousness at a popular level, 
reflected through the political class across Europe and reflected in uh, where we see uh, the German government um, uh, and the French and others now standing. So moving forward, uh, if, if your assessment is that she has not yet reached the conclusion, because you indicated that if he does reach the conclusion that the Russians will fail uh, catastrophically, militarily, um, if he hasn't yet reached that conclusion, what kind of assistance could China provide Russia? In other words, now from Putin's perspective, what would Putin want and what is she prepared to give in the, in the period in which, in which we're in? You, you wrote a great article in the Financial Times. You referred to, can they substitute for SWIFT? Uh, what can they do about frozen, frozen Russian assets? They can certainly absorb Russian oil and gas, but c can you flesh those out for us? Yeah, sure. Um, one further factor, though, in the Chinese uh, analysis of what unfolds in Ukraine itself, before we get to the question of what they could supply the Russians, is the current debate in and around Washington about the possible use of chemical weapons um, by Putin in Ukraine. Um, if Putin resorted to that level of uh, a vertical escalation of the conflict, of the war, of the invasion, because he was not prevailing with conventional weapons, even with the uh, uh, massive conventional explosive devices which he's currently using against civilians, and if he was going to think about crossing the chemical weapons threshold, I have no intelligence to base this on, I have no hard information to base this on, but my instinct is that the Chinese would find that a bridge way too far. Um, and if I was to hazard a guess as to what the Chinese may be saying very quietly and discreetly uh, to the Russian military command at present is, do not cross that threshold. It would make it too hard for us. Now, as I said, that's a uh, hypothesis. Um, I'm not saying that the Chinese uh, government are a bunch of um, uh, peaceniks, um, quite the reverse. It's a Marxist-Leninist party, which happily saw 30 million people die in the Great Leap Forward, which happily saw 3 million executed in the, in the uh, agricultural reform movement of the early 50s, another million dead in the Cultural Revolution, quite apart from whatever happened prior to 1949. Mm -hmm. So there is a Marxist-Leninist view of human casualties, which is frankly not terribly emotional. Um, but I think uh, the bottom line here is that in terms of China's international political equities and its own domestic uh, public opinion, which the regime places store in in Beijing, crossing the, the WMD threshold by Putin in Ukraine and therefore in Europe by deploying chemical weapons in the battlefield my sense is for the Chinese that may be a bridge too far. Um, you asked about what support they could provide. What's really interesting, Aaron, is that based on all the information I've got so far, the Chinese are acting in a manner which complies with existing uh, US and allied financial sanctions against, uh, against Russia. And there's a reason for that, and that is that China is still deeply vulnerable to the uh, US dollar denominated international financial system, both through SWIFT, but more broadly through the, uh, the uh, uh, construction of foreign reserves and the, and the dollar's um, centrality to global financial transactions generally. Portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, settling of trade accounts, quite apart from foreign exchange reserves, etc. So because the Chinese renminbi or the yuan is not a freely traded uh, currency, um, because their own capital accounts are not open, they are closed, it means that China is still, as of now, vulnerable um, um, and will be, in my judgment, for much of the rest of this decade, though they are seeking to reduce that vulnerability over time. That's a long-winded way of my saying is, therefore, their predisposition to breach financial sanctions um, uh, is, uh, is going to be very tempered by the vulnerability that they fear they have if secondary financial sanctions were imposed against China itself for breaching mm. sanctions against the Russians. For military supplies, which is the other 
uh, thing the United States has been most concerned about legitimately. Um, I think the administration blowing the whistle on that publicly uh, a week or so ago uh, was a smart move um, because the Chinese system at the end of the day, Aaron, is bifurcated. You've got a military wing, you've got a foreign policy wing. They ultimately answer to the US, to the Chinese president. But I think part of the logic of what the United States did the other day was to go public uh, with the um, nature of recent exchanges between the Russian and the Chinese military, as the Americans have alleged, um, in order to make sure the rest of the Chinese system was fully aware of what was going on. Um, so therefore, on that score, my judgment for what it's worth is that at this stage, there'll be a reasonable degree of reluctance for the Chinese to cross that threshold because it's likely to end up with where we, where we just uh, discussed, and that is the risk of secondary financial sanctions if you were to become military suppliers to the Russians at this time. Right. So the but absorbed sale of, of oil and gas, uh, I, I don't know what percentage of Russian oil and gas go to the, go to, goes to China, maybe 20 percent. That since uh, the U.S. hasn't uh, sanctioned exports, energy exports, that would be the main con that would be the main contribution, you might say. Yeah. On the trade front, you'll find that uh, anything that the Russians can do with the Europeans, which, as you said, with uh, oil and gas sales, and that continues. China will uh, happily um, uh, benefit from itself. Uh, China wants to increase its, um, as it were, oil and gas security of supply. So the Russians will benefit from that. Remember, prices are high, largely, ironically, because of the war, but that predated the war as well. Um, the other thing the Chinese will seek to buy from uh, Russia, because they've had a bad harvest, will be wheat. Um, and uh, there are a range of other co commodities of continuing interest to China, including forestry reserves in the uh, Russian Far East. By the way, your judgment on the military assistance question, I think, is it is worth a lot. And just to um, remind our listeners and viewers, um, the time, New York Times reported that the U.S. briefed last week that Russia had requested five types of military equipment from China, service to air missiles drones, armored vehicles, logistic ve vehicles, and intelligence-related equipment. And they kind of downsized that a few days later by, again, administration reporting, New York Times reporting, that um, the Russians requested drone secure radios and MREs. Um, mm. We know from uh, press reporting uh, that food, uh, the Russian military, is an issue in, in, in Ukraine. And it's part of that transparency uh, tactic that the administration has used, both pre-invasion and post. I think you're right. It was smart. Just to, to conclude on this point, a rational analysis, if you're President Xi, on what's unfolding might go something like this. I've got this huge Omicron problem, and I touted myself as the nation that basically conquered it. I've got a major economic challenge. I think it's 5.5% 5, 5 .5 growth this year. That was the target. I've got a 20th party Congress coming up in which my personal leadership and judgment will be at stake. I don't need this Ukraine thing. What, what, is, what exactly is Putin doing? Therefore, uh, if it doesn't start to improve, I'm going to start pulling back a bit. Now, if, if that were the, if that's, Maybe that's not today's analysis, but what does pulling back, what would pulling back actually mean? Uh, assuming there's no use of, of chemical or biological weapons, how would it manifest itself? I think you're right to point to this aggregation of political pressures um, uh, being directed at Xi Jinping domestically. Um, and this uh, is very much alive in the article that you referred to before that I wrote in the Wall Street Journal last week. Um, um, and um, you're up for re-elect in November. Uh, people are anxious about the fact that you are intending to become leader for life um, because what will you be like after November, given we've had the sharp edge from you politically and domestically before November when you're on fixed term limits? <clears throat> um, will you become like Mao in the future and what will happen to me and my family? Mm. Uh, third factor is a slowing economy for a range of reasons, but in part uh, poor domestic policy settings over the last several years by Xi. Uh, 
Uh, then you've got, uh, as you said, uh, um, the uh, pandemic uh, jumping the border from Hong Kong. Now 50 million people in China are under lockdown across 70 different cities with a further impact on economic growth. But also, given the vulnerability of China's uh, aged population, one of the things I'm concerned about, um, purely humanitarian point of view, is you've seen so many a death of so many deaths of old people in um, Hong Kong. Um, what's going to happen, therefore, in the mainland, given you've now got uh, a widening caseload, a low vaccination rate, and an ineffective vaccine uh, in the Chinese domestic vaccine? And given you, Xi Jinping, have told China for the last two years that we Chinese are clever and we've defeated the virus, and those crazy Americans and those crazy Europeans. Um, because of their crazy democratic capitalist system, have failed miserably in containing their virus, suddenly it presents you with a domestic political narrative problem, Aaron. And then the final part in this admixture is, um, is, um, is Ukraine, which, as I said before, is not uh, predominantly a Xi Jinping decision, but it is significantly a Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping decision. So to go to your point, um, what would um, a walk back by the Chinese look like if the thresholds I mentioned before were crossed? I think the first thing, uh, the first uh, walk back you will see <clears throat> is China uh, complying operationally, but not in a declaratory sense, with the American uh, bottom line about non provision of financial and military aid. Um, that will be read significantly in Moscow. Um, you see, on the financial front, you might be able to offset what you, uh, the financial uh, sanctions by, as you've already indicated, very large scale uh, trade purchases and payments in advance for that. Um, uh, that's possible. But in military, there is no substitute for that. So if you're in Moscow looking for a barometer of a change, it would be that. The second would be, as I said, if um, Xi Jinping concluded that that Putin was going to lose in the battlefield in Ukraine, uh, the second big sign would be China moving from a nominal interest in being a mediating power to being an active participant as a mediator at five minutes to midnight in order to recoup some of its, shall we say, foreign policy loss in the eyes of the Europeans and the rest of the world as they sought then to engineer a, a ceasefire. Do you think the Chinese have the, I mean, you got you got a thousand flowers blooming now in terms of mediation. You've got the Turks involved, you've got the Israelis involved, uh, the French and the Germans. Um, could China have an impact? I mean, in other words, could it deliver enough honey on one hand and vinegar on the other in order to induce a change in, in Putin's calculations based on the damage he's caused and how difficult it's going to be going forward? Right now, if we're talking about right now, about what's probable, I'd say it's highly improbable that China yeah. would become a mediating power. And as you said, every man and his dog wants to be a mediator at the moment. And um, and um, uh, and the, cr the critical factor in this is that Putin at this stage is completely immovable uh, from uh, his position. So... As I said, the Chinese are experienced uh, in the business of statecraft. They would only, I think, act at five minutes to midnight when, as it were, the die had been cast in order to, as it were, mediate the, be seen to mediate the final stages of this. But we're nowhere near that, yeah. in my judgment, uh, at this stage. Let's uh, shift for a minute to Taiwan. Um, and the, the analysis on the impact of Ukraine uh, again, it's it's clearly unfinished business. We're still, who knows where we are in the timeline. Either argues that um, Ukraine has demonstrated that um, a quote unquote great power can in fact project its military power in advance of its aspirational or national interests. Um, uh, most of the analysis now seems to argue that that Ukraine, as it stands now, has reinforced Xi's risk aversion 
with respect to Taiwan, not his risk readiness. And I, I realize, and I hope you'll talk about this, that she has his own logic and timetable about what conditions might must, must apply before he would seriously consider a move on Taiwan. But can you speak to the impact? And again, I know we're midstream here, or even quarter stream in, in the way the river is running. Uh, but could you speak to that issue of how you think she is looking at this situation vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the uh, framework of Chinese strategy over Taiwan. Um, and it's largely impervious to external influence. <laughs> so um, um, other than the United States, but let, let's come to that. Um, the Chinese uh, strategy towards Taiwan under Xi Jinping, in my judgment, means that there is unlikely to be a Chinese military move against Taiwan this decade. It's more probable next decade, mm. all factors being equal. There are two factors which determine uh, uh, when China will want to act. Uh, the first is purely militarily, which is there will need to be an overwhelming balance of power advantage, balance of military power advantage between China on the one hand and the United States, Taiwan and possibly Japan on the other. Uh, for the Chinese to be confident about the ability to execute a military operation cleanly. Um, and if you like, um, that's the pre-existing Chinese position. Uh, the experience of Putin on the ground in Ukraine would simply reinforce that natural strategic caution. But that caution has long existed. Right now, if there is a war tomorrow in the Taiwan Straits, all the desktop exercises that have been conducted in the last decade still deliver a, a win to the Chinese. Mm. But from the Chinese point of view, um, this is not in the level of absolute certainty that their political leadership would want. Um, the first line in Sun Tzu's Art of War is, war is a great matter of state not to be undertaken lightly. If you lose the war, you lose the state. Um, uh, so that's kind of drilled into the cerebral cortex of most Chinese political and military leaders. The second element in the equation is uh, the um, uh, question of China's uh, exposure to uh, financial sanctions and economic sanctions, which we discussed before. Um, if we thought there was a risk of financial and economic sanctions flowing to China over uh, sanctions busting activity in support of Russia and Ukraine, can you imagine the volume of sanctions which would hit if China itself was to invade Taiwan? Well, um, what's the Chinese calculus there? Um, their calculus has always been that to be financially and economically ready for an invasion of Taiwan, you need to have become already the world's largest economy, the world's largest financial system. Um, and, um, and in addition to that, have floated the renminbi, opened your capital accounts, and no longer be vulnerable to US dollar denominated uh, financial hostility. Um, now that's quite a ways off, um, but if I look carefully at the way in which the Chinese financial and economic authorities are planning on that front, I would like to be in a position in my judgment of beginning to float the renminbi and open their capital account toward the end of this decade. Again, that's a analytical surmise on my part. It's not a piece of intelligence or hard information. But, uh, and China would seek to do so for its own intrinsic economic reasons as well. But why are these two factors therefore critical? They are the two which will shape a final decision on a move against Taiwan. Looking at Ukraine then, the leadership in Beijing will say, well, uh, what we've seen so far is A, Putin was militarily unprepared and B, he was financially unprepared. Well, right. that just reinforces what we always thought. So let's uh, we'll just redouble our efforts. But to think that, therefore, the railway tracks have either been stopped or diverted in a different direction, I think, misreads China's ultimate determination, which has existed since 1949, uh, to return uh, Taiwan to the motherland's embrace. Look, uh, you may not want to play this game, but I'll ask the question anyway. If you had your five minutes with... President Biden, what would you tell him um, 
is the best approach now? Again, we're midstream, quarter stream in this crisis, and the amount of uncertainties are extraordinary here. It's so many highways and byways where this crisis could go. But right now, would you say, uh, Ms. President, you're doing a pretty good job, but here's what I would suggest in addition, or you need to change course. What, what advice would you give them? Yeah, you're right to say I never liked being armchair strategist because having been a head of government myself uh, in the past, the last thing you want is some jerk out there telling you um, <laughs> uh, what to do and when you should have done it with uh, 360 degrees hindsight. I know um, the, you know the or, feel. I'm a different... 180 degree hindsight, I'm sorry. The, uh, the, um, um, but let me make a few points. Um, I think the administration, uh, given all the factors at play here in relation to Russia, uh, China, and Europe, have so far uh, been uh, highly competent in the way in which they have managed this given the complex variables involved. Not perfect, but nothing in the business of foreign policy is ever perfect. Um, secondly, um, the principle which I think has been at the centre of President Biden's strategy is to maintain maximum alliance solidarity and solidarity across the democratic world. Had we had this uh, invasion of um, Ukraine happening under Trump, can you imagine, A, what Trump would have done, uh, given his curious relationship with Vladimir Putin, and B, um, what the state of the alliance would have been in Europe and in Asia to rely upon for a common cause uh, in support of Ukraine against Russia? So the investment which the administration the last 12 months has put into the rebuilding of alliance structures has actually been fundamental to what's been achieved so far. Because if there wasn't European buy-in on the financial and economic sanctions front, frankly, uh, we would be nowhere uh, at present. I think that's the second element. So uh, sustaining that level of alliance solidarity uh, is no easy thing. Um, wheels constantly need to be re-oiled in one way or another. Um, and so that's an ongoing operational challenge for the administration. I think the third element, uh, or the second element of the strategy, uh, third point that I'd make, uh, is that it, it simply is a matter of military logic that whatever hardware and software the Ukrainian military need, the United States has got to ensure it gets there um, without, uh, as it were, uh, uh, leaving Zelensky high and dry. The fourth principle, which is do not trigger World War III is a, is a, is a robust one. Um, and, um, and much as uh, we would have seen popular support for no-fly zones uh, in Ukraine, etc., cetera, um, uh, Article 5 of uh, the NATO Treaty uh, is, uh, is a very live provision. And if you suddenly have a Russian reaction uh, to a no-fly zone imposed by either the Polish Air Force or somebody else, and suddenly you're in a world of, shall we say, wider of a wider war. I think um, the final point I would make in the equation uh, is, is this, that um, sustaining the pressure on China in the way in which they have done through the early release and continued release of intelligence information is extremely useful. Um, you see... Um, China would have liked to have, would have preferred to have been in the shadows of this, providing tacit support for Russia, but not being in, on the front pages. Well, China's been on the front pages now since day one, and since they signed, signed that joint declaration together in Beijing on the 4th of February. Therefore, keeping China on the front pages must also be part, uh, as the US would see it, of their own strategy, um, because it maximizes the prospects of, um, of keeping Chinese financial and military support to Russia at a minimum. I think that'd be the five core elements. Worthwhile advice, to be sure. Uh, we're nearing the end of the session. I did want to ask you about domestic opposition. Um, it's a complicated subject. Um, 
apparently there were there was there has been criticism though reasonably um, there was criticism actually yesterday or today by a re reasonably high level official in Shanghai on the U.S. China perception monitor. Uh, he said, quote, China cannot be tied to Putin and needs to be cut off as soon as possible. Five of China's most respected historians have publicly condemned the invasion. Uh, they write, you cannot call a deer a horse, obviously, in an effort to gloss over what's actually happening in Ukraine. Uh, access to both items on the internet were immediately blocked by the government. I think I, I know the answer to this. I know very little about China. Is there a serious constraint or drag on uh, President Xi in the wake of Ukraine? Does this, does this attach to him personally? Yeah, because um, he's been a... Um a significant factor personally in the admixture of both the joint declaration of 4 February, subsequent bilateral meetings um, by video with uh, Xi Jinping, um, and uh, the fact that uh, China today, as of today, has not um, either referred to uh, the Russian action as an invasion, let alone condemned it, um, means that within uh, Chinese domestic politics, he's vulnerable. Uh, on this question, um, but placed in the context of what I described before as all the other things that are swirling around Chinese domestic politics at present, it's, it's one vulnerability. Um, secondly, you're right to point to the Chinese um, uh, foreign policy researcher Huawei from Shanghai uh, and his long uh, piece opposed to the um, China support tacit support for the Russian invasion. Um, by the way, that piece was not a love letter to the United States. It was simply a piece by Huawei saying, if you're a sensible Chinese nationalist, the last thing you would do would be to enable the rest of the world to rally against Putin and by extension China. Right. So, um, so you need to put that into context. The five historians uh, were very much uh, on the question of uh, international law. Um, as you said, both were peeled down. But I think in addition to that, a couple of other straws in the wind, which are worth uh, pointing to, social media reports that former Premier Zhu Rongji uh, has reflected uh, reservations uh, about Xi's handling of the war uh, and his support for Putin. And finally, as a perhaps a partial genuflection to different views in the Chinese community about all this, uh, there was a further report a couple of days ago that China's propaganda apparatus were now not simply tearing down social media posts in support of Ukraine like they were before, like there is now some permitted level of social media expression of solidarity with the Ukrainian people. Now, all these things are uneven, they're messy, um, but they're all straws in the wind. Um, but for this to become a de decisive factor in Chinese domestic politics, you'd have to get to a stage where China, <clears throat> where Putin, as we said at the outset, outset of this conversation was in terminal military trouble um, in Ukraine itself. Uh, or, not just failing in the field in Ukraine, but potentially falling in Moscow, my Russia analysts, analytical friends, I'm not a Russia expert, I'm a China expert, tell me that the probability of Putin falling is remote, that he still has high levels of domestic political support, something authentically in the direction of about 70%. Um, not my shit, I don't know. But if you're asking me the question, what would trigger a fundamental, uh, as it were, critique and attack of Xi uh, in Beijing on his Ukraine policy and Russia policy, it would be military failure in Ukraine and or Putin falling in um, in Moscow. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that's a good good place to end uh, on, a, on a happier note. Um, and uh, Kevin Wright, I want to thank you. It's been a to use the cliche, but in, in your case, it, it happens to be, as the virtue of being true, of a 40 plus minute masterclass in, in analyzing a complicated situation with extraordinary clarity uh, and honesty. Um, so I wanna thank you for that. And thanks for coming on Carnegie Connects. Perhaps we'll have you back. Hopefully this crisis will come to an end soon. Um, we'll see. But again, take care and thanks again for everything that you do.
Thanks very much, Aaron, and thank you to all of our friends at Carnegie and for the excellent work they do uh, around the world, including in Beijing, Moscow, and elsewhere. And you have many friends there. <laughs> you have many friends. Take care. Thanks, Aaron. All the best.